Welcome to the June 2023 SICA webinar, The Future Digital Landscape. I'm Paul Berry, Executive Director for SICA. The Collision Industry Electronic Commerce Association, or SICA, develops and promotes electronic communication standards that allow the collision industry to be more efficient. We also provide webinars like this one to help educate both members and non-members on trends that impact systems, processes, and the exchange of data across the industry. Today's presenter is Chuck Olson, Senior Vice President of Operations and Automotive Technology at AirPro Diagnostics. With 43 years of experience in the automotive technologies and the collision repair industry, Chuck has a passion for technology and the automotive industry and in his current role at AirPro Diagnostics. As we start the webinar, I want to remind you there is no verbal communication between the participants and the presenters. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the questions panel on the webinar screen. And we'll answer as many questions as possible by the end. Well, actually, today we're going to answer questions throughout the presentation. Uh, and Chuck would encourage everyone to please uh, ask questions as we go. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chuck. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you for, uh, for the opportunity here. And like Paul said, I'm going to take a couple pauses in here. So if you have questions or comments uh, along the way, I'd like to, to encourage you to put those in and we'll pause along the way and just kind of see how this, uh, uh, some of these concepts around the things we're facing as an industry uh, and also around blue sky thinking and some of the, uh, the history on that. So I'm going to be sharing some of my perspectives and, and views on the mo mobility pro uh, progression and some of my own trips uh, in the blue sky. And uh, I've got a few different things that, uh, you know, impact my train of thought on this. And uh, I would like to share that uh, with everybody attending uh, the, this webinar today. So I'm going to start off a little bit. It's uh, make sure you see the right screen. There we go. So, you know, for for me, when I start thinking of a, a blue sky, and for some reason, this talking head song always pops into my head. And, uh, you know, ask ourselves, how, how did I get here? So with, uh, in, recently, I've, I've been reading a lot of stuff and researching a lot of things of some of the, uh, the great things that's happened over the years, uh, not only in our own industry, uh, but, uh, you know, for the United States as well, and some of the past and big ideas and how they came about, where they came from. So with, uh, I don't know if many people have uh, watched some of the series that come up on uh, Curiosity Channel or Discovery Channel uh, about the great projects and uh, some of the men that build America, but uh, some of these great stories, I just find them fascinating, uh, like the, uh, the concept of the Hoover Dam. Uh, and everything that went in to make that happen. It sounded like an almost insurmountable task for something like that to, uh, to actually happen and in the time frame that it happened. And uh, the ideas and thoughts that, uh, that went into making it happen under the time constraints. And, uh, and then a few of the others are the, the Panama Canal. It's, uh, uh, there were several concepts that were put together with the Panama Canal and, and getting that built. And, Several times there were failures and had to go back to the drawing board in uh, in, in order to make that a reality. Uh, and then we get into uh, you know a little bit into the mobility and the mobility hit history of the Continental Highway System uh, for the automobile and the transfer uh, transformation of mobility. So the things that had to happen there, which you know also led to uh, the building of the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge. Uh, which actually, you know, was kind of a competition between two different companies. But, you know, with those several things along the way, had to go back to the drawing board and had to be addressed uh, in order for a lot of these things to happen. It, uh, so, in, and then kind of going back to some of my personal experiences and uh, when I was young, it, uh, you know, one of the most dangerous things that, that we have to happen, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard this, is, you know, we, we do things because this is the way we've always done it. And uh, in, in my younger days, and you know, even before I even thought of, you know, what the concept of blue sky thinking uh, was or whatever, uh, I was working for the Department of Defense, and I was on the line that's uh, uh, rebuilding starters. Uh, you know, these big starter mo 
motors for diesel engines and, you know, had to build so many a week and we're taking them off a rack and taking them apart. As I look at these things, it's like all the brushes are stuck. Uh, everything in the back end is just goopy and nasty and these things were taken them apart. And part of the training that went through this is put this together. Whenever you put in the back bearing, you have to take a big scoop of grease and put in that bearing. And when you put that big scoop of grease in the bearing, you put it in there, and then the starter would get hot, the grease would melt, would get the brushes, it would get all the filing, so the brushes and these things were failing left and right. Uh, and I was just a young guy, you know, I had a supervisor, but, uh, but I had to really push and start asking the question of why are we putting this big scoop of grease in there? And uh, the, the answer was that uh, that's the way we've always done it. And they've done it that way, way for years and years. But over the years, as the brush went through, they went from open face bearings to sealed face bearings. So when they went to sealed face bearings, they were still putting the scoop of grease in there. The grease had nowhere to go. Hence, it was causing problems. And, you know, these kind of things with, you know, that's just one of the many experiences that uh, I've seen with that. And, uh, you know, kind of how we got here. So what, uh, and then I, I've got another story that uh, I just I just really found interesting, and uh, uh, some people on this may have heard this as well. But it has to go with the uh, the standard of the width of railroad tracks of four feet eight point five inches, and that's a very odd number. And uh, you know, as we look at solving problems, you know, one of the things that we talk about when we're solving problems is why are things the, the way they are. So with uh, this story, like I said, some may have heard it before. But it's interesting how it progresses. So what uh, the width of that is because that's how wide that they uh, they built the uh, the trails in uh, England where the uh, uh, where the railroad tracks were going, and that was the width of the wagon tramway. And so they used the gauge for that. But uh, the people who built the tramways they used the same jigs and tools, and it was a particularly odd wheel spacing. But when they built the wagons. That was because of the widths of the uh, uh, the ruts in the road, and if they did it any other length, they would risk breaking their wagon wheels. So that that, that decision was made. So uh, why were they there at that spacing? So it comes back to who built the old rutted roads, and that was Imperial Rome, and they built the first instant roads in Europe and in England for their legions, and that was off the width of the chariots. So why was the width there? The, the width of the chariots. Well, that's how wide the chariot had to be and it needed to be narrow to move quickly and accommodate the horses that were pulling them. So that standard remained after for, for years and years and it's still the standard today because changing it would uh, be so difficult. And it's also interesting, it gets to the point of the space shuttle design of the width of the rockets from Viacon in Utah that they had to design the uh, the size of the rockets because they were shipped by rail and had to fit through the tunnels that barely accommodated the width of the railroad tracks. So it uh, was kind of a, a little bit of a humor in this story. And the thought of being is that a horse's butt is what determined a lot of the things that we're still working on today. So what uh, as we worked that those just a couple of interesting stories and uh, some of the things that you know gets my thoughts. Uh, into uh, blue sky thinking and when this talking head song plays in my mind, how did I get here? And a lot of these things are built on the foundations that have happened long before us. So as we get into this, and this relates to, uh, you know, what we have in automotive in each area, especially in blue sky thinking, you know, we have our own disciplines, so we have our own area of uh, what it is that we're addressing in, uh, in blue sky. So the main drivers are between safety, performance, economics, and convenience uh, are things that come in there. And specifically in the uh, in the automotive space, going back, and I didn't go back, I may need to go back a long time in the uh, uh, beginning of time, but, uh, you know, things that started to, to progress to solve problems that we were seeing are, are things like seat belts, uh, uh, lighting. And then, you know, electronic fuel injection came into play, emission controls, airbags, anti-lock brakes, stability control, automatic HVAC body controls, and then electronic cruise control. 
And some of these are, are directly hit one of those categories between safety, performance, economics, and convenience. And um, this was kind of the beginning of what I'd seen, uh, especially when we started transitioning into uh, into the digital world. And uh, it's actually progressed. Since then, so we've we've had a, a digital world in the automotive space for quite some time, but it's just amplifying as as time goes on. So from there, the next things that uh, that kind of happened, then we start we've seen some transitions and uh, progressions more digital with uh, electric steering, tire pressure monitoring. We went from airbags, if you remember the early days of airbags, they were a pretty scary thing. And if you think back into it, you know, with the idea of putting airbags in a car, what a crazy idea that that was. It's like, how are you going to do that? How are you going to control? And some mistakes were made that expanded into uh, uh, dual zone airbags and different airbag zones. Seatbelt retractors. So not only now that we have the, have the seatbelt, we've got the seatbelts to help in an accident and uh, uh, prepare and protect the safety of the driver and passengers uh, during that event. So that's, a, uh, that's another idea uh, that came into reality. Uh, cruise control advanced to adaptive cruise control to automatically control your speeds. Headlamps went from basic lighting to adaptive lighting. Uh, then, of course, there was a weight reduction, uh, which goes to the economics of uh, uh, you know, the fuel economy and the economics of the, the, the price of fuel and those things. And then a little bit later, telematics, GPS, and mapping came in uh, as a convenience and was also tied to safety. And then remote start locking and unlocking uh, in the convenience side. And now within the uh, the last few years, we've got the uh, uh, with the SAE J3063 active safety systems. And uh, I wasn't going to go into ADAS as a whole, but uh, kind of the things that evolve around ADAS, which is our collision warning, uh, our collision uh, intervention, driving control assistance, parking assistance, driver monitoring. Now we've got electric propulsion, which is going into mainstream. Uh, hydrogen power is being uh, explored more and more, uh, whether it's to recharge electrification uh, or as hydrogen power as uh, uh, used as a combustible to, uh, to drive vehicles. So all these ideas are moving forward. Uh, and then the driving automation, uh, which, you know, the autonomous vehicle, if we're going to get there, uh, is uh, from level zero to five have been defined. And what's interesting about all this is the things that have happened before, uh, the seat belts, the lighting, going into uh, telematics, GPS mapping, adaptive headlamps, uh, tire pressure monitoring. All these systems in the third column are dependent on those things that happened before. So as the new ideas come into play, the old ideas have to be accounted for and be able to go on forward. And in a lot of times, I'm sure that there's been some groups of people that have spent some time in some blue sky thinking, getting to automation. Before we get there, we have to have solid electric steering, steering that we can control, uh, throttle controls, electronic throttle controls, that kind of things that continue to build on that. So what, uh, and one of the, uh, one of the other things that I found, uh, Interesting was uh, part of the development of the highway system is uh, when the roadways and the city roadways, when a uh, a project was put into place for the primary purpose of improving uh, uh, pedestrian safety. Because before the automobile and the pedestrians, pedestrians shared the streets, they walked up and down the streets, there was uh, you know, with horses and carriages and automobiles got involved in this, there really wasn't any rules around that. And uh, there was a lot of pedestrian fatalities that happened as the automobile and pedestrians were sharing that space. So as the automotive uh, came in and some standardization in the signage, in the uh, controlling intersections and all this kind of stuff, the primary purpose was to protect and separate the pedestrians from the roadways because of these vehicles. And again, that was just another idea with that primary purpose. All these other things came into place that also reduced accidents, 
like like controlling the intersection, controlling speed limits, and those types of things, which began with larger uh, grand opportunities that came into place with development of, uh, of the highway system. So with, uh, you know, looking at those things and, uh, you know, kind of how we got there is important so that we can make solid decisions as it is that uh, that we go forward, which kind of brings me to uh, to the next side is some of some uh, blue sky thinking. And uh, I'll just pause for a moment if there's any other examples anybody can think of that has gotten us up to this point, or if there's any anything uh, in there, Stacy. If there's any questions, if they're not, I'll just carry forward. Okay, so it's uh, I got a couple of things, couple of things here, and you know with with blue sky and this is this is a topic i actually ended up doing a little bit of research trying to figure out where it came from and uh the subject of blue sky is much more than just a uh management or executive management buzzword that's uh that's kicked around and a, a lot of really cool stuff happens there and blue sky thinking is far from a new concept but whatever happens in this conceptual space is almost always new. And it's not necessarily right or wrong, but uh, thinking of options and solutions without being bettered by what you have done or capable of doing or anything else that may constrain you uh, in any manner of trying to arrive at the best possible solutions when we have problems. So with uh, uh, and genuine blue sky thinking uh, needs to be open to any new avenues of thinking and then to pursue them in an open minded way. And it's about breaking free from any limitations. So what uh, uh, it in, in the blue sky, this can happen individually. This can happen with the group. Sometimes blue sky thinking sessions have to happen with the group to solve particular problems or how it is that we go forward. So we look at a problem from blue blue sky pers uh, perspective. You don't want to rule out any solution, no matter how infeasible it may seem and regardless of what it might cost. And, and these are the points to where big big things can happen and also where things that, just where you find out things are really bad ideas as well. But uh, you need to make sure that you bring your problems and dilemmas along with, with your trips into these, uh, into these spaces, like I said, whether it's individually or if it's in a small group uh, or if it's a plan session, whatever the case may be. And uh, the allure is based on the premise that the ideas beget more ideas. This isn't about individual ideas. This is about sharing ideas. So one person may come up with a blue sky idea that's just completely impossible in their location or within their space or within their budget. But that idea inspires another idea that may inspire another idea and so on. And this is where innovation takes place. So we have things that happen in the computer science space that nobody thought of an application in automotive when these when uh, these inventions and new ideas were taking place. But they can be adaptable into the spaces that we have. So as we're solving problems and going forward with with these new challenges, uh, we need to have the opportunities to open up in our own minds of what's going on in some of these other spaces. And uh, sometimes you come back to the ordinary solutions, which only perpetuates a mistake that may have been made in the first place. But again, it comes back to what is the solution that we can do, what's feasible, but within the blue sky area, you want to make sure that everything is laid out there, uh, no matter what it is. Bring the problems, bring the things that, needed, that uh, need to be taken care of and that thing. The only thing that you don't bring is the limitations because everything is uh is on the board and chuck uh bill group uh mentioned that crash detection on iwatch and iphone and the standard of gms on star yeah that uh, uh yeah i mean that that was a fantastic uh, uh innovation uh with the cell phones and the crash detection and the safety category that uh, that came into place, and uh, I was pretty fortunate early in uh, in my career when uh, I was still working with GM at Cadillac dealership, and uh, installed some of those very first systems. And uh, my father worked for uh, uh, 
for the Department of Defense was a Marine, and uh, some of the early discussions, he was kind of upset about that. You know, the military device, devices, you know, with GPS, and now private companies are, are taking it, taking it over. It's like, well, we all paid for it. I remember these conversations. We all paid for it as taxpayers, and that's an innovation of taking something that collectively was put together with multiple people with innovation uh, to bring safety to the masses of something that was developed for a completely different reason. So that's a great comment of, of what those say. And there's going to be more of that to come. Excellent. Thanks. And we have a, a question and comment from Eric Reichman. He wanted to know, how can we be using LLMs and AI in our industry? He was wondering who else might be interested in machine learning as MSOs are able to aggregate e-data for collision repairers and wondered what your thoughts were. Yeah, and I've, I've got a couple of things that uh, are coming up a little bit later in the uh, in the presentation, other opportunity for discussion specifically on that topic. And I find that very intriguing and I'm glad to hear from people that are already having these same thoughts. And that's really what Blue, Blue Sky Sessions are about is what's possible. So what, uh, in, and again, you, you don't have to coordinate a session or a management meeting or anything in your organization to get to that place. You can enter into these things with a small group of people, just yourself or a colleague, and start kicking these around. But the important thing is, is to make sure that you take the opportunity to share that with other people. So I've got a saying within our own organization that all ideas are good ideas when they're in our own head. We need to get them out in the air, have other people hear, hear ourselves say them, and sometimes we find out they're really not such great ideas after all. But it may be a good idea for somebody else to be able to build upon uh, what we talk about. And AI is a good example of that, of what the possibilities are there. So, uh, you know, and, and one of the other opportunities I, I, I kind of wanted to bring up, you know, with, with Blue Sky, sometimes the Blue Sky sessions will come in because of a desperate situation. Uh, the demands of desperate measure, like an emergency or something like that. And uh, sometimes those situations, you have no option but to get in the blue sky and figure out uh, what it is that's going on. And that uh, just brings me to the story and the example of the, the bringing the Apollo 13 home. So a lot of engineering, a lot of blue sky, we're sending, we're sending people to the moon and bringing them home. And all of a sudden things started to go wrong and there were no solutions in place uh, for these things. And that's a perfect example of a, uh, of a desperate situation. They cleared the deaths, they brought in the engineers, this was the, and they came up with a solution in that, uh, that critical situation. And within our own organizations and also within us as, a, as an industry, we will see times where things are implemented, things are going to be put into place that all of a sudden aren't working exactly the way that we expect them to. And we've got to be able to uh, pull together and work those, uh, work those things out uh, so that we can get to those solutions. And uh, I don't know how many people have watched Apollo 13. I've probably watched it 10 times. It's uh, one of my favorite shows. So uh, in a little bit of this presentation, I apologize, but some of it is just the world according to Chuck, but I wanted to make sure that I shared it with everybody. So I'm going to get into uh, something I came up, and uh, I, <clears throat> I'm going to be perfectly honest. I just made this state stuff up out of uh, out of the blue sky, and I was kind of thinking about my own experiences with coming up with solutions. We come up with ideas of the blue sky thinking, but uh, at some point we got to bring them back to earth to where things happen. And uh, I kind of thought of this concept of the green line or possibly the tree line. Uh, so you've got all these unfettered ideas, all these things, and you're, you're starting, starting to bring them back down to put them into practice. And the green line, is, uh, the, the concept I have of this, this is where you start seeing rules. This is where you start seeing the regulations. And if you're trying to fly down through, you know, bigger tree line or a thick forest, you're going to have to pay attention as you navigate your way back down to make sure that you don't crash land as you come through those things. But, uh, you know, that's where the economics come into play. Can these things be afforded? Uh, is it feasible? How is it going to affect other things? Is there a law that says that I can't do that? Because in the blue sky, 
we have no, no rules. We're opening up everything. But as we start to bring it back down, that's when we have to consider all of the all of the other factors. And we may find that those ideas, as we navigate our way through the green line, might have some limitations or bring up some additional opportunities to change some rules. Some of the rules may need to be changed. Some of those rules, like how wide a railroad track is, have been set years ago and are uh, are unchangeable. But there may be other rules that can be changed just because of the state of technology has brought in new opportunities. Uh, so you can bring some of those uh, uh, back into the blue sky when they're encountered and uh, propose some solutions to some of the rules, some of the regulations, whether it's a safety regulation, an economic regulation, whatever the case may be. So uh, I'll just pause there for a minute if there's anything that I may have missed that anybody else perceives the difficulties of incorporating new ideas and navigating through the rules, regulations, procedures that have been put in place previously. Chuck, I'm just wondering if you have some advice for attendees if they want to put together groups in their own organizations or start meeting, what are some recommendations, what you've seen before to get things going? So if, uh, I think for us and in, in, in our experience, we got quite a few different groups that, uh, that go together with, it, uh, with this is, uh, you know, when it comes to like blue sky thinking, a blue sky uh, approach to these things is define and bring your problems. It's like, what's, what's the problem that my organization or my space within the blue sky uh, is addressing? Because everybody's part of the blue sky they go into is going to be a little bit of a difference of uh, a uh, different space so at uh we're all familiar with the term of uh, uh birds of a feather flock together so what uh so depending if it's law related or economic related or our industry vehicle repair related safety related is to identify which problems that you're going to bring into the blue sky with you and just totally unencumbered bring them together and uh uh, and with small groups. And the, the other piece of advice that, uh, that I can give in this is no rules. You can't bring rules into it. You can't, it, it, uh, I mean, it needs to be open to everybody. And also invite some people that maybe haven't spent much time with these types of activities and uh, that may have been having difficulty in the green line area, the rules and regulations area. What are some things that we need to address? Because a lot of times what happens is you're going to have more questions than answers, and uh, that's for sure. Great. And Eric Reichman mentioned Discord and GitHub. And okay. Bill and Bill Group uh, said many changes are regulated by how the organization can digest change, and change is naturally resisted. <laughs> Absolutely, it's, uh, uh, I love that. So uh, uh, I got another saying I use quite frequently: uh, "Change is good. You go first. So, uh, uh, but yeah, incorporating some of that change at uh, you know at uh, uh, with some discord, and sometimes that happens. Sometimes that can uh, derail a little bit of uh, of a blue blue sky session if you have things that are predisposed because of uh, regulations or rules or predetermined ideas that are objected to at the beginning. And, and, and that can be an easy trap to fall into on these things as well. And some very good ideas can get, uh, can get thrown aside because of those things. But I think you need to revisit those and look for the, uh, for the opportunity to change to change them and possibly invite in some uh, some additional participants. And Bill's so the, uh, comment is the only thing consistent in change in a company, the only thing consistent is change in a company to survive. Oh, hallelujah. The, the, could, could have said that, uh, that better myself and uh, uh, through my career, it took me a little while to realize that, but I finally realized that's the only consistency we have. It's going to continue to change. 
same thing with technology and uh, a lot of the things we're going to be facing going forward. So the last area I, I ran into this and uh, and again, I, I just made this up on my own and uh, in relation to blue sky and that's the brown ground. And the brown ground is that's where things are happening. That's where the decisions have been made. That's where we're executing the ideas. That's where we're discovering where the problems are that need to be identified and brought back into the blue sky, brought forward as problems, navigate through the green line. Do we need to get regulations changed? Are there rules and things in place that, I mean, when it, when it comes down to it, it's, uh, if somebody says you can do something, yes, you can do something, but sometimes you don't have permission to do what it is that you want to do. And that's what you have to discover through the green line. And those limitations, those problems are discovered at the brown ground. And that's what the people that, that are doing things, that are executing things, that identify problems. And there's a lot of good ideas that are sitting on the brown ground that never get the opportunity to be brought into uh, into the blue sky to be navigated back down and back through. So encouraging people and the communications through those three different levels uh, is is very important as well. And uh, I see a lot of those things uh, uh, starting to happen uh, with the uh, with the calibration within organ or uh, collaboration within organizations between their different departments and uh, bringing down the silos also within the industry. I mean, there's several things that are happening within the industry. I'm seeing some great progress there. And uh, it kind of goes back to, uh, to some of the times, some of the early days where I was working in a dealership and working as a technician, some things were developed within the OEM that opened channels to where we could bring customer satisfaction issues or safety issues to the surface and actually be heard. And that, that was a progression that didn't exist earlier on in my career. And that opened up some opportunities as well. So I would encourage any organization, what, whatever vertical is that you're working on, is to make sure that the paths are available to get the information from the people on the ground ground that are executing day in and day out. These are also the people that are gonna be receiving instructions or updates on different procedures, different ways to make repairs, different ways to address things to do them better and faster. There is just so much great information there that needs the opportunity to be brought into the blue sky. So it's, uh, I don't know if anybody else had any comments or any opportunities of how to join those, uh, uh, those two different areas together. But as I was thinking about just blue sky, blue sky is a fun place to be, but it isn't the do all end all. It's just it's a lot of fun. But uh, until you get to the execution piece and get to put those other two pieces together, you could end up wasting a lot of time. So Chuck, this is Paul. Let me ask you a question. In your experience, I think the the conflict that companies run into when they're trying to approach like a, a blue sky uh, concept is the reality that every IT department's already got a project list a mile and a half long, and there's already other problems and issues that are in flight. So how, what's your experience? How do you how do you bring something, this blue sky idea, and how do you shepherd it through so that it sees the light of day? So that, that, that's an inter interesting question. Sometimes it takes a couple of trips into the blue sky. It, uh, cause I mean, getting it, uh, you know, whether it's through an initiative or a prioritization that's happening through the green line with rules, regulations, IT functions, those types of things, you may run into some roadblocks in those areas of executing what looks like a great idea. And you may need to take the pause of that, bring it back in, invite some of those people in to build on that idea so you can push it back through to get to the execution point. And uh, uh, sometimes it takes multiple rounds on, uh, on, on different initiatives uh, in order to get there. Thanks. Hopefully that wasn't too convoluted. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think your point is fair and I think uh, Okay. Bill Grew just added in that culture is critical to allow more blue sky thinking to occur, and I agree with him. I think 
blue sky can't function in an organization unless leadership embraces it. It's it's it requires uh, acceptance at the top. Uh, and yeah. uh, again, I use the term shepherding because you do have to shepherd these things through the organization. Yeah, yeah, and and I and I, I would agree. So that blue sky or exploration alone is not enough. So with uh, and it's not undertaken purely for its own sake either. So with uh, so you got to bring it to bear on a particular issue, the challenge, the problem, the opportunity and look at new ways to arrive at a better sense of how to proceed. So, and, you know, it's just like, sometimes you can get in the middle of crossing a stream and find out this wasn't the best route, and now you gotta come up with a, with a new idea. Kind of back, you know, when all the plans didn't work with Apollo 13, they had to clear the slate and come up with a new idea. Yeah, and that just uh, Bill Groot also added in a comment that many times blue sky is best facilitated by someone outside the tent. I think that's a that's a fair observation. Yeah, and uh, it, it depending on the culture uh, that that you have. I mean, if there's an established culture uh, for that already within your organization, of course you can carry. But if you're looking to get started in that area, a facilitator is a good choice. And there's a lot of people that can do that, you know, kind of uh, uh, thwart and make sure that the preconceived notions of what you're going to accomplish before you enter in there can be left at the door. Because those are the things you don't want to bring with you. You want to bring your problems, but not the preconceived notions of how it's going to be solved. So, but, uh, Kind of with that, if, if that if those are my my three levels and, and my experience with with the blue sky thinking, and I kind of uh, wanted to focus at this point going forward of of some of the amazing things that are happening within our industry right now, and our opportunities to take these things that are happening and innovate the best ideas that uh, that we can come up with collectively as an ind as an industry uh, to address that. So this newest one that came up is, uh, and, and some may have seen this a little bit in the news already, but uh, the concept and uh, actually development of a software-defined vehicle, which is uh, just more of our future digital landscape, but more about defining the vehicle. And there's some really good information out there. I'm not an expert in the software-defined vehicle, but I, I am very, very interested in it and, uh, and want to know more. So with, uh, and, and again, this is just, you know, with the progression of all the things that have happened over the years and what are the next steps going to be. And I'm sure there's several of us in this industry that will have some opportunities to contribute to it. And this is signaling the shift from the mechanical engineering, the, the ICE vehicle. I think a lot of problems have been solved there uh, already with the longevity and the uh, reliability of the automobile. But now with the software connected vehicle, those kind of things are taking place. So some challenges that, that came up and I did some research and I've got some uh, from some of the autonews.com articles and those things I was looking at is how Tesla was able to overcome the shortage of uh, automotive grade semiconductors by reprogramming firmware. So what's, I'm, I'm sure there were several meetings and some ideas to be able to come up with, make that happen. And Tesla was able to make that happen of using more advanced chips uh, to be able to be adopted by firmware so that they could uh, they could keep going with their platform. And I think there's going to be a little bit more of that going on. Uh, GM is going to be working with a foundation software defined vehicle working group and contribute technology that it calls you protocol. Again, this is from the autonews.com articles, uh, which connect vehicle applications to the cloud mobile devices and allow software components to communicate more easily across multiple operating systems. So, you know, with uh, we come into infrastructure, the internet of things, of uh, th these things being better and better connected uh, as we go forward. Uh, Toyota's created a software unit that the uh, chairman of Kio, uh, Toyota had indicated, may subsume its automaking business of, uh, of software. And, and for the automotive loom business in the, in, the, uh, in, in the past century. 
So that was kind of his take on this. Now, granted, this doesn't mean the things that we have right now are going to all of a sudden stop to exist, but the progression is starting to take place and uh, us being able to get into that. Uh, Kozo Sato, uh, Toyota's successor, said that by listening to what the cars have to say and controlling information to a higher, more integrated degree, we can increase the value of the cars in a way that is tailored to each customer. Safety, economics, all of those uh, those those main things that uh, that are in place, but those are the main things that come to mind for me. And then to kind of go on a little bit more, some articles from Repair Driven News and also from Future Ride. So uh, these are some initiatives. So uh, infrastructure based 5AB uh, technology for level five. Uh, adaptive LIDAR is another technology that's coming to place. This is a technology that uh, was used in aviation and other disciplines besides automotive. Uh, Rightware is creating uh, the future of vehicle human interface modules. AutoLab, uh, new airbags. So remember early on with the airbags. The airbags did not perform the way they intended. A lot of people thought it was a crazy idea, but today new airbag and new airbag technology is fixing that. Uh, holographic displays. I mean, this is the things of science fiction, but they are coming into reality. And how are we going to embrace this? Uh, Continental announces the uh, uh, brake by wire. That sounds like a very scary concept to me. I didn't like drive by wire with throttle controls or electronic steering when it first came out. Uh, my take on it was it was too dangerous, uh, but the problems have been worked through and uh, now a lot of those things are uh, are mainstream. So with, uh, with the announcement of that, that's another thing, uh, AI advances, uh, the cloud collaboration, there's just tons and tons of stuff. Uh, uh, mobile drivers for cockpit technology, what is the driver of the vehicle going to say? And what, what does this mean uh, in the future? Then the strategy analytic uh, highlights increasing integration of EV electric motors. So there's a lot of other concepts going there uh, on, uh, on the electric motors. So these are just some, some of the, the big areas of things that are already moving that us as an industry uh, has to be able to embrace and is going to affect what happens on the brown ground in our shops in the uh in in our insurance claims in our repair claims in writing of service information i mean all these things are going to affect all of us and just like the comment the continuous thing is going to be changed so we're going to have the continuous change uh that we're going to have to deal with and are we ready for this to pop up on our iPhones or Androids or whatever you have? So highway AI mode. So with, uh, I hope it doesn't get to a point where the vehicle decides where it's going to take us. Hopefully we still have uh, uh, our own decision making that the vehicle will take us where we want to go, not where the vehicle wants to go with artificial intelligence. Uh, tongue in cheek intended there. but. Uh, I don't see that it's going to end. It's kind of like trying to define infinity. You can't really define infinity. So I'll pause there for a moment if uh, there's any additional comments or questions. Matt, how would you recommend that our industry stay up to date with some of this new technology? That's because it's changing so quickly. Yes. Uh, Right now, and uh, I'll start to move on for that uh, little bit to this next slide. I, I mean, what does this mean for us? And what if we, a little bit back to blue sky thinking, fill in the blanks? So at, uh, it's more of a question and, and a great question that you had than, uh, than an answer, but uh, being involved in cross-functional uh, uh, training in different disciplines, or not necessarily cross-functional training, but just cross-functional awareness of what's happening in uh, in different verticals, and uh, with that, and you know, with with SECA as well, and uh, participating with the different SECA, different SECA committees, as uh, along as with a lot of with quite a few other uh, industry organizations, 
uh, has been a great opportunity and actually facilitates a lot of that. We get a, uh, a lot of side benefits that I've seen from participating uh, in those committees uh, beyond what the core purpose is. So what the, and when I talk about, you know, cross-functional or cross-vertical awareness, these are the main categories. And I did, I pulled this off the, uh, the SECA website, and each one of these categories also has some more definition uh, on the website of the, uh, uh, of, of the, of the industry sections. So with, uh, with that, it's, uh, I'm not sure if Paulette's on or Paul, if you can go with that up to this, if I missed anything, uh, but these are the main categories that we have going on. And, uh, you know, we may be involved in one or two of those. Yep, Paulette, would you, uh, could you take a minute and just uh, talk about the committees and provide an update on those? Yeah, sure. So um, I thought that was our next slide. <laughs> this was our- There we go. Industry. There we go, there they go. So um, we have, um, right now we had the emerging technologies and we currently put that one in on maintenance mode. Emerging technologies really did a lot for the um, CICA and we have um, got a lot of new um, code lists and some different um, data that was added. But along with that, we've added a lot of new committees to drill down into um, other areas. So we have an AI committee, an OEM repair procedure committee um, that's looking at the build sheet data as well. And um, the EV committee, those were all things that came out of that emerging technologies committee. Um, uh, the calibration committee was also um, something that had been in maintenance mode for a um, probably a little over a year. And with um, emerging technologies doing some discussions, and we started looking at calibration again. And we um, reviewed the, the business use cases at that and the workflows. And we did see where we needed some new code lists to help identify some of the new attachments and stuff that go through with um, calibration. Um, so, and then we also have a brand new referral committee. And that is where a third party is making the referrals um, for an appointment or an assignment, but they're not accepting those um, business use cases or the, the expenses of the authorization. So um, we're working on that. Um, so that is, I believe I talked about all the ones that are active at this time. Does anybody have any questions on any of the committees that are active or the process of a committee or? Yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've got one question, Paulette, and, and, and actually I know the answer to this question because I've heard it asked before, uh, but uh, when, when new members or different members start getting involved with some of these committees, they don't have a full understanding of what the type of standard is that SEEK is doing. And there's been, you know, a little bit of misconception. I actually had a little bit of misconception when I first started getting involved in these committees is what are, what's the definition of the standards that SECA is actually doing? I mean, we're not doing, SECA is not coming up with repair standards uh, or OEM repair procedures. Can you put some color around that? Yeah, so SECA is looking at the, um, the data that's being transferred in between the different industry segments. So how can we make those communications, um, electronic communications standard for all the different segments. So if you want to send an authorization to a, a rental company or an authorization to an insurance company or a repair facility, you would want that to all have the same data. So the same data links, the same type of um, information being shared so that you didn't have to change that message that you're sending for everybody that you're talking to. So that's what we're just trying to find out that data standards. Um, what kind of data needs to be shared um, so that everybody can have those same um, pieces in place and make the communication um, smooth and the implementations for the technical side to be um, very um, smooth for everybody. Paul, do you have anything you want to add to that? You're a better speaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, you, you did a good job. I think that you know, one of the benefits of SECA is obviously we develop standards for exchange of data across the industry. But when you participate in the committees, as Chuck, I think you were alluding to, you get a great education. And back to Stacy's question of, well, how do you stay in touch with what's going on in the industry? Um, I think the emerging tech committee was just amazing. I, I, I learned so much going to those meetings. Uh, and so I think 
one of the best ways is simply to engage in these committees and be an active participant because you do really get an opportunity to learn a lot. Yeah, and yeah, you don't have I mean, to be a member as I, you don't have to be a member of SICA to come to our committee meetings. And that's a, also something you don't, you know, you can come and you can help and you can listen and you can be educated and, and not be um, an active member at the time. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, and, and with, you know, several of these different committees within SECA, it, you know, with cross functionality from uh, uh, other organizations within the industry, you know, between CIC, between, a, between SAE, and, and quite a few others, it, uh, there's a lot of things that are going on with members that are also part of these other committees that also support each other as well. So, and, and I get, you know, with the communication standards and, you know, we talk about, you know, getting things from the brown ground up to the blue sky to be able to have, in my opinion, SICA with the communication is one of the concepts, especially when it, 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 it's complete, I think it's doing a fantastic job at this point, is just going to make those communication channels better and more consistent. With that, that's uh, uh, pretty much everything I got there, and it's uh, got it done in uh, eight minutes to spare. So with, Thank uh, you. And we did have a question about: Is there a list of committees and meeting times? And on the SICA website, under committees, there's some information um, as well as a link. And you feel free to reach out to any of us through the website. And Eric Reichman also. Um, asked if we could share the standards so independent developers can build if you're not a SICA member. And I'll take that question. Um, unfortunately, no, this is, these are intellectual properties that are protected uh, and require SICA membership. However, SICA membership is very affordable for a small company starting out, um, depending on whether, you know, how you're gonna use them, 750 to $1,000 a year. Uh, so it's it's very affordable, but uh, if you want more information, I would encourage you to go to Sika.com. We've got all kinds of information there, or if you just want to schedule a meeting with me or Stacy or Paulette, we'd be happy to meet with you and uh, answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Paul. And the meetings are virtual, so Eric had that question, and um, they're all through Microsoft Teams. So. Thank you. They got anything else sitting there, Stacy? Um, I think we have. Uh, Bill had Bill Groot had a comment back to Blue Sky Thinking. Blue Sky will be the driver of AI implementation with our industry. Someone outside the tent will have the solutions long before those in the tent. Remember George Jetson. <laughs> I think we had talked about that. Yep. Yeah, great comments. So with that, let's progress to this. With all the meetings being virtual, except for the annual conference, right? Right. Thanks. Thanks for uh, pointing that out, Chuck. Yeah, Sika has our annual conference. Uh, it'll be September 12th and 13th in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, we strongly encourage you to attend. If you want to learn about what's going on in the industry, it's a great way to do so. Uh, we've got a really good lineup of speakers. I think it'll be very interesting content. Uh, you can go out to Sika.com slash connects uh, to get to the website and see what uh, see who our speakers are and to register for the event. So we strongly encourage everyone to do so. We'd love to see you there. And with that, um, this presentation has been recorded and will be available later today at Sika.com. I'd, I'd invite you to check there to uh, see future broadcasts and watch recordings of past webinars. In addition, we have partnered with the Automotive Management Institute. Attendees of this webinar are eligible to receive credit towards a professional designation from AMI after taking a short quiz on their website. And the link will be sent to all attendees uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so please follow SICA social media platforms to stay up to date on upcoming SICA news and events. 
And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Chuck, very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye, all, and have a happy 4th of July.